Let's open up our Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. But in the new year, we're going to start a new study. We're going to get out of the Old Testament for a little while, and we're going to do a study first part of this year in the book of Romans. What do you and I know about the book of Romans? First off, who's the author of the book? Paul. Paul is the author, and what's Paul's intent in writing this book? When we think about this letter and we think about everything that's said, what is Paul's mission? What is his purpose in writing this book? To explain salvation. In chapter 1, verse 16, he says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Right here Paul tells us about the book. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Now when we hear that word gospel, what is Paul talking about here? The word gospel itself means what? Good news. So Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the good news. Now, this term gospel was used in everyday language in the Roman Empire. It was used by Jew, Gentile, everyone. That word gospel, we're going to talk about good news. Just like today, you and I, this evening, tomorrow evening, we may turn on our TVs and watch the news. And what's our number one complaint about the media in America right now? It only focuses on what? the bad. Can't we have a news story that is actually good? The same in the days of Jesus, the same in the days of Paul. Here is this word gospel. There has to be good news out here in the world. As Paul writes to the Christian people when he uses the word gospel, good news, what did a man or woman of God, where did their mind, their heart go? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. We're not ashamed of who? Jesus Christ. Here is the good news. Here is the greatest news ever. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And the message of the gospel that Paul writes about here is the coming of his son And he's going to say, here it is, this this message is all about the cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. When you and I today talk about God being a God of love, the love that God has for all of us is defined through the cross of Jesus Christ. If not for the cross, where are you and I? Where is everyone? We're lost. So this message of the gospel, the cross, is the message of God's love for us. And he says this message then is for the Jew and for the Greek also. And Paul's habit, when we read through the book of Acts, when we read all of Paul's writings in the New Testament, Paul, when he would go into a city, who would he preach the gospel to first? He would go to the synagogue. He would find the Jewish believers. He would go to them, and he would preach the message of the good news of Jesus to his Jewish brothers and sisters because it was through them that Jesus came into the world. And Paul firmly believed because of that, these people need a chance to hear the gospel before others. Because so many Jews that he was dealing with throughout the Roman Empire, they weren't in the city of Jerusalem. They weren't in the land of Israel. They'd been scattered for years away from their home. And so he wanted to be sure that God's chosen, according to the old covenant, would have the opportunity to hear the message of Jesus Christ. Everything you believed about Moses and the prophets, here is Jesus. It's fulfilled in him. So here's the good news. The Messiah that we've all been waiting for has come. And that's who Jesus was, God come in the flesh. And so Paul would go to the Jews and he would preach to them. And then once they began to make their decision about Jesus and the gospel, and sad to say, far too often it was a rejection of that gospel, then Paul would do what? Then he would go to the Gentiles in the area. 
And he would say, here. And after 70 A.D., when Jerusalem is destroyed, we then begin to see that wherever people went to preach the gospel, they went to the Gentile world. They didn't make that distinction between Jew and Gentile because the gospel was for everyone. But in this letter here, Paul writing about the cross, about the gospel, to the Jews, to the Gentiles, saying it's time now for us to come together and understand that the fulfillment of Moses and the prophets was that God will now save all people through Jesus Christ. And that's what he's doing by writing this book. And you talk about one book in the Bible that kind of summarizes everything that God ever wrote down. It's here. It's this letter to the church at Rome. And so Paul writing and saying, here it is, Jew, Gentile, we need to understand there's really no difference between us because with the law, without the law, we all ended up being what? Sinners, lost, in need of a Savior. And so let's accept that and let's move forward, a new way of thinking. And so Paul's writing, and he's writing to these people, and here's the message. Now let's begin reading here in chapter 1, verse 1. And as Paul writes, he says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Now, as Paul always does in every single letter, when he greets the people, one of the thoughts that he brings up very often is that he is a servant of Jesus Christ. Why does he state that fact? I'm a servant. How many times do you and I, when people introduce us to other people and people say, well, tell me about yourself, we begin our conversation with, I'm Michael and I am a servant of Jesus Christ. When was the last time you and I did that? Has anyone ever done that? <laughs> it's not something we think about, is it? And why not? This was embedded in Paul's mind because of the good news, because of the gospel, because of what Jesus has done. I am his servant. Which means what? Who is Lord? Who is Master? Who's the one in control? Who is the Savior? Who is the one that owns me because of what he did for me? Paul, always very keenly aware of the humility that it takes to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And I am the servant, and he is the Lord and Master. And in Philippians, he would write about that, and he would say, here's the astounding thing. When he came to save people, in chapter 2 of that letter, he says he came and took the form of a servant, and being found in likeness of man, the Holy Spirit, thinking, speaking through Paul there, says, if we're mankind... We are servants of God. Humanity, the definition for humanity is a servant of God. He took the form of a servant and being found in likeness of man, you're a servant, you're humanity. <laughs> you are the created, not the creator. And that's why Paul would write those words. Speaking on the behalf of the Holy Spirit. And so as he opens his letter here, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. He came to this earth, became a man, which meant he took the form of a servant. He was a servant. If he did that for me, paid the price for my sin, and in that gained the right to be called Lord, so that as he would go on to say in Philippians 2, that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow in heaven and on earth. 
his becoming a servant made him our Lord, he has the right to be the Lord. I'm going to be his servant. And then Paul would write and John would write and others would say, and one day when we are in eternity in heaven, then once again we will be made like him. Now, what all the ramifications of that are, I don't know. But in some way, our position changes. Our relationship to his, him changes in eternity. See what Paul's saying here? And for you and I to be reminded of the fact, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. We come into the foyer, we meet people. We introduce visitors to other people. And I've talked about this through the years, I don't know how many times, and 99.9%, in fact, actually 209% of you will say, this is Michael, he is our, and why? This is Michael. He's a servant of Jesus Christ. We introduce Johnny, Huey, Stephen. This is Johnny. This is Huey. This is Stephen. And these men are our what? Elders. Why? Here's Damon and Caleb and Jimmy. They are our deacons. Why? Here is Paul, and you know what you and I would do with Paul if he came walking in here? Here's Paul. He is the apostle. Why? Because we're hung up on what? Titles, prominence, position. And Paul says, if you need to identify me, <laughs> well, let's start with servant. Let's start with servant. A lesson for you and I to learn. Servants of Jesus Christ. And then whoever we're introducing to whoever this is my brother, this is my sister. They're faithful servants of Jesus. And how amazing. How amazing. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Now, he then, speaking through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit understanding how we are as people, the next statement is what? I'm a servant of Jesus Christ, an apostle. Now, why this title? Why does the Holy Spirit allow Paul to say this? I'm called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Now, lots of scholars talk about how Paul did this to establish his authority. And I think there's some truth to that. To establish his authority so that as he would write, people would understand, this is the Apostle Paul, because people were always, especially the Jews, hung up on the fact that Paul had forsaken them and he was no longer worthy to be part of them, and they did everything they could to discredit him. And God kept doing what? To the degree that Paul would say in the Corinthian letter, God has allowed me to see things, 
that I can't speak about, but to keep me from becoming, he allowed me to have a thorn in the flesh. And three times I went to him and said, God, take this away. And what did God say? No. (laughs) My grace is what? Sufficient for you. You don't need anything but what you have, Paul. Be grateful for my grace in your life because it's that grace that is the focus of your life. Not that you saw things that other people didn't see. That was kind of something that God did for you to encourage you to keep you going. Others didn't need to know that. So God worked to make sure that you didn't let that go to your head. But people always going after Paul. Paul's unworthy. Paul's not an apostle. Paul this. Paul that. Not my apostle. Does that have any relevance to us today in our society? God working to humble us as a nation. (laughs) Because if we read Scripture right, Scripture says what? According to what we'll see later on in Romans. Who puts people in positions of authority? Who allows nations to rise and fall? And it's the same way in the church, brothers and sisters. Now, here's what I think Paul was really going after. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ... And some of you need to get hung up on that word apostle, but the word apostle in the New Testament, it was a common, ordinary, everyday word that very simply meant one who tells a message. A messenger, a speaker for someone else. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ, and my service to him is I was called to tell his story. And I think Paul had that meaning in mind too. Because that word apostle when we capitalize the letter and say the apostles, who are we talking about? That handful of men that Jesus hand-selected and said, here, you are my closest. You are going to be the ones to start telling the story. And he worked in a very unique way through those 12, 13, 14 men. But by and large, when we read Ephesians once again, he gave in the body of Christ different gifts to different ones, some to be apostles. We automatically jump back to the 12, but that word there in the context, he gave some of us the gift of telling the story. Isn't that amazing? (laughs) I'm a servant of Jesus Christ, and as a servant, I'm called to tell his story. That makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Because the last words of Jesus, before he ascends back to the Father, to his twelve, But to all of us is what? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go and make disciples of all nations. Which means every one of us here today can say with Paul, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ, 
who's been given the responsibility to tell his story. Isn't that amazing? (laughs) And that's what the Holy Spirit's wanting us to understand here. And that's the danger that we get into, brothers and sisters, when we start elevating people. You know, there's one man today sitting in Rome in a, a massive structure that we call the Vatican. And if you're ever in Rome, take time to go see that thing. Man, it, it, it is incredible. It, it is amazing. The artwork in there, the sculpture, the gold, the precious stones. I, you just can't believe how in the name of Jesus that kind of wealth was amassed and put into that structure and into the bank there. You know the Vatican has its own bank, its own government. It is a separate entity from the nation of Italy. It controls its own destiny. And this man that is called the Pope, he's the only religious leader in the world that has a hotline to the leaders of China, Russia, United States, England, France, all heads of state around the world have a hotline to that man. Isn't that amazing? But that's what happens when we get tied up with titles. And this man called the Pope, Papa, Father, And when people get tied up in titles, what tends to happen, folks? And a good lesson in that for us. Paul writes very humbly, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. My mission is to tell the story. I'm set apart for the gospel of God. Now that word set apart could have been translated sanctified, sanctification. And the word sanctification means what? Set apart. The day you and I confess Jesus and we go to the water and we're immersed and we're washed clean of all our sins, we come up out of that water and what does Paul say, 2 Corinthians 5? That in Christ, and that's how we get into Christ. And folks, being immersed is the only way you and I get into Jesus Christ. The only way. And when we do that, in Christ, we become what? New creations. And a part of that being a new creation, I am sanctified I am set apart for what? Servanthood and telling the story. And that's what Paul's wanting us to understand here. Now, yes, Jesus had an encounter with Paul and said, Paul, you're going to be unique because you're going to go to the heads of state. The Gentiles are going to hear the message of the gospel through you. And when Paul writes Colossians 1, down in the chapter about verse 13, 14, 15, 16, he says, the whole world has heard the story of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? The man that God said, I'm going to use you to go to these heads of state. But Paul was able to do that because he understood I'm a servant, and whatever God says, that is what I have to do. Remember Isaiah chapter 6? Isaiah's writing, talking about how the Lord called him. The angel came and put hot coals on his lips and said, okay, listen, here it is. Your lips have been cleansed. They've been cleansed for one thing. God is going to give you a story to tell his people And who can God send? And Isaiah says what? Here am I. Send Norm. Right? (laughs) Here am I. Send Steve. 
here am I, send Roger, right? Here am I. And Isaiah answered what? Send me. I'm looking for servants to tell my story, to go into the world, to preach, to make disciples. And we, the servants of Jesus Christ, say what? I'm your apostle, set apart to tell the story. Here I am. Send me. Amen? And that's how Paul introduces this book. Is this a good place for you and I to start our new year? We, we talk about resolutions, goals, whatever you want to call it. You, you and I want a worthy goal for the new year? Go home today. Get out your notebook, your journal that you're going to keep this year to write down your prayers and the scripture text that you read. That you're going to use to write down five things each day that you're thankful for. And you're writing for today. Romans 1 verse 1. In parentheses, Michael's translation, Debbie's translation, Alfreda's translation, Travis's translation, Mark's translation. Michael, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to tell the story, set apart for the gospel of God. Is that a way to start the new year? Amen. And brothers and sisters, there's our challenge for today. We'll pick up here next week, continue in verse 2 and move on.